There was once a single man, and this single man had no trouble at all <clears throat> in earning his living. He went to the business place every day, five days a week, earned his living, had a good income. No problem with that. He had no problem if something went wrong with his car, he could always usually figure out what to do about it to get it back in shape and running right again. If the furniture in his apartment fell apart, he could take care of that. He had no problem in particular with everyday physical living. But that's all he could manage. Everything else outside of earning a little money to pay for the rent and taking care of general life, Everything outside of that was in chaos, which was 99 and 9 tenths of his life. Lonely, scared, looking at pretty girls on television and wanting them and not knowing, not being conscious that he wanted them. He had no idea of himself at all. He was a machine like most men and women. So with this heaviness of loneliness and desperate seeking, he tried to find something to do with himself that felt worthwhile, that would make him feel good. Now he didn't understand that whatever he did from his loneliness, from his anxious desperation, he didn't understand at all, which you should understand, that whatever he did, whatever action he took without wisdom, that that action was always circular. Wherever he started, he came back to. He started with anxious desperation, and he'd go out and he'd try to get interested in the baseball games. Everybody gets excited over the baseball games on television and seeing them in person. So have you ever done this? Sure you have. So he bought a little book of the batting records of the ten topmost baseball stars and he took paper and pencil when he watched the game. Hey, one more hit for that first baseman, second baseman of the Cincinnati team. It never works, does it? Soon, sooner or later, you, you pause with a pencil in your hand. What am I doing? I'm not interested in the baseball scores of the National League or the other league, American League. I'm not interested at all. When you do this without wisdom, the only thing that can happen is greater anxiety because you say, what if I come to the last chance I have to find myself and it is nothing. So you usually keep yourself going whether it's your daydreams or whatever to keep some hope alive which is the biggest mistake of your life. Abandon all hope ye who wish to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Because the hope is really the hope of you maintaining you and there's no you to maintain so the whole thing is complete delusion. One day in his search for the next thing to do he ran across a newspaper ad, and it was pretty good size, cost a lot of money. And the ad showed a pretty country club out in the woods, mountainous area, 50 miles from his home. And it told about a big evening of special fun with single people emphasized. That's what he was, single, so it caught his eye. And it had the fee there for the night, the entrance and parking extra, things like that. But it showed several pictures, it showed, of course, it showed people having a good time, right? Dancing, and it showed the, the old man of 90 talking to a girl of 30, 20, would that make you feel better, girls? You know, that's how they get people, and, you know, the man's always gray-haired, talk to a young girl, and he says, I'm not too old if I go to that, so they put their money down. Some of you men are smiling. <laughs> How much did it cost you, Franny?
all excited. Gets in his car, drives out there. And as he drove out, he noticed that a storm was gathering up above. Clouds getting darker, a little bit of hint of a rain on the windshield. Fine, so he drove in. There it was, a big, great country club. One of these old mansions had been converted, a big, you know, what you'd call a magnificent place and a big ballroom. And it was right at the edge of a cliff, you know, like at the Grand Canyon. You go to the Grand Canyon, they have a big hotel or something right next to the Grand Canyon itself. You could look out your window or stand on a little balcony and look down for a couple miles down into the big gully down there. Went in, checked in. As he walked through the door, he was nervous. And let us interrupt at this point. Why do you take it as a habitual response condition for you to always be nervous and uncertain when you go into a new place? The reason you do that is because your old nature has a set of fixed responses and you know exactly what to do while you're home because you've done it a thousand times. You're familiar. You see your neighbor across the street and you wave or nod. No problem there. You've done this mechanically. Put you in the slightest new condition and you're lost because you haven't built up roles, phonograph records of what to say, what to do. Work, work assignment. You get into slightly familiar, unfamiliar conditions all the time. Just meeting another person here or there, seeing someone unexpected, whatever. Why don't you simply see that you don't know what to do and then don't go into your usual mechanical foolish response? Remember you're told up here just stand and shake and do nothing about it? You just walk into that new situation and know that you're going like that knowing that it caught you unaware, and don't do anything about it. That would eventually break it down, where you can go literally, actually, you can go anywhere in this world and be perfectly at home. Those, those hard, glaring eyes of those people, you walk into the room and 20 people there, they hear the door open, you walk, walk in, they all, all turn and look at you. What's that to do with you? See? You're, you're such a stranger to yourself. Everyone else is a threatening stranger to you. All right, back to the man going into the big country club perched on the edge of the mountain with a storm beginning to gather. Goes in, and the first thing he found out was that there was something wrong between the advertising of the price of the room and the actual cost. Oh, but sir, you didn't understand gimmick. You didn't understand it was twice as much as what we said it would be in the ad. He paid twice as much as he wanted. Already he's resentful, huh? Is it worthwhile? He's stuck now. You're stuck now, right? Why did you get stuck in the first place? Why do you go in the first place? No, I'll tell you why. Because you have your eyes closed, hoping that if you keep your eyes closed, some magic little genie will make your dream come true. And instead you get shocked awake just for a moment and then fall asleep again and do the same thing again. And the next country club on the other side of town. Went up to his room and he could hardly wait for the big announced ball that took place. Started at 7 o'clock. Big ball. Big enormous room. Hundreds of people. And already he was pretty excited. Oh, lots of women there looking for rich husbands. Any of you ladies ever look for a rich husband? <laughs> or have you given up hope? <laughs> Settle for anything. Huh? <laughs> Sir, do you make as much as $50 a week? <laughs> so he went downstairs and fixed himself up as nice as he could do with nature, what nature gave him. And, <laughs> oh, and there, there it was, hundreds of people waltzing around with Champagne. C H A M P. I just forgot how to spell it. Champagne, right? Now it's been a year since I gave that one, so it's all right for me. And he got excited and terrified at the same time because he's just like you men. You seated here and you listening here. Because he sat down and, you know, they have the chairs around the edge. You can sit down and kind of look out. And, oh, all those pretty girls out there. 
Huh? And he was looking for the girl of his dreams out there. And some of them turned out to be nightmares, so he went on to the next one, on to the next one. <laughs> Finally, he saw a girl that really appealed to him, pretty, you know, and kind of shapely and looked look kind of nice. And he didn't know something, gentlemen. He didn't know the reason he wanted to get her was to get her into the bedroom. He could never admit that that was part of his thoughts. And you had better start. Now, here's his problem. He, he didn't know women at all. He didn't know himself. He, didn't, he was scared of them. He was scared of women. How many of you men are scared of women? All you men raise your hand. Timid. He didn't know how to talk or what he should say. So he's afraid of the time when he'd have to approach this one pretty girl that he saw. You know, and try to get away with him. Get his way with him. Finally, he did over the punch, the big bowl of punch. We finally got talking with her. I'll, I'll just listen to this. She was pretty, <coughs> shapely, looked, looked good. And but the first thing that disturbed him is he started, you know, small. You know, starts with a small conversation. Where are you from? You know, and all that stuff. As if anybody cares where you're from. <laughs> it's where you're going. You care about. <laughs> But he noticed something, but being an unaware human being, he didn't want to see it, and so he pushed it back into his unconscious where he wouldn't have to face it. And what he saw was a certain hardness about her face. Are you following men? Have you ever met a hard woman? You know what I mean? And that was the first warning, but oh, I'll tell you, he, he, he's been reading too many books and seeing sex scenes on TV even now. That overpowered it. So anyway, we got talking with him, and she said, um, fine, we'll get together for dinner. He, su he suggested for dinner at seven, hour later, or whatever. So he went back to his room, she went back to her room. And he kept looking at the watch, he could hardly wait at this. He, Have you ever been in this? He could hardly wait till seven o'clock when he'd knock on her door, and he wished he would never come. <laughs> right? That's what you call internal conflict, division, the whole business. Finally, at five minutes to seven, he went up, you know, five minutes, that's not too early, he knocked on her door. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited, no, no answer. Knocked again, no answer. And he, you know, wondered what's going on. Maybe she stood him up already. He hasn't even had a date with her. She stood him up already, maybe. Ever been stood up? Well, wow. ever stand anybody up? Finally, she came to the door, and, and as she opened it, the first thing that registered in his mind when looking at her, her face, the first thing that registered in his mind that she had a blank, unrecognizing face. As if, you know, like that, stare. And he knew right from that one expression, she, she didn't, didn't even know who he was. And then she had to, you know, catch it. Oh, yes, that's, a, that's that wolf I met downstairs. And she recognized him. So, and then came the next reaction of annoyed expression on her face. This is a long story, it makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I notice that you are paying attention. <laughs> All right, the hard look on her face at the start. The, the blank look was second. She, she didn't have an instant recognition. Third, the annoyance. So she said, oh, come on in, come in. So we went in with her and sat down and as she walked away to go to the back room to finish getting ready she gestured toward the clock and she said you're early and and she said it in real real irritation you see she was so vain among other things she was so vain she doesn't want the world to catch her with one little golden lock out of place and there was ten golden locks out of place when he opened the door, see? And it ruined her dramatic appearance before him and the rest of the people. She went to the back room. He sat down, nervous, wondering, wondering if it was 
how he got into it in the first place. He didn't know. And you know, when she opened that back room to disappear to finish getting ready, as the door opened, as he looked inside there, you know, just happened to casually look in, he saw the corner of a bed. And when he saw the corner of the bed, being an unaware man, he didn't know how excited he got because that put all the associations in his mind of having sex with her, which was his real aim, which she knew too. She closed the door and he sat down and he waited and waited and waited. No, not a sound, not a cheery word, just a minute, I'll be out, sorry to be late, nothing like that. Cold, stony silence. Finally, at 25 minutes after 7, she came out. Have hey, I mean, you ever met a girl like this? Well, you be careful or you will. If you don't pay attention to what you're hearing right now, you will. It's going to cost you a lot of money, a lot of stupid waste of energy and time. You will. You're dumb. You don't, you don't even hear what I'm saying. You'll go out and do something. You women will do something. And then she wakes up. Finally came out. Oh, man, was she fixed up right, you know? And he, he, he knew if he barely touched her arm, she'd jump. Don't mess up my co-fair. <laughs> <laughs> my taffeta gown. See, the taffeta is the only woman's material I know, so I use it over and over. <laughs> and, and, you know, taffeta is shiny, and it, and it's, it, it makes um, ocean waves. <laughs> Doesn't it? When you walk. Okay, that's enough of taffeta. Saltwater taffeta. They went downstairs, and his next shock was the menu, which he didn't understand, and everything was so expensive and all that stuff. But they, they ordered dinner, and uh, while uh, he was having dinner with her, he wasn't a complete idiot, just 99%. <laughs> He noticed that while they were having dinner over the lobster thermometer, <laughs> yeah, pretty good, huh? His temperature was also rising. <laughs> he noticed that she didn't know that he was in the room. She was consuming the food and drinking the champagne. But get this, get it, so it doesn't ever happen to you men. At the time that she was having dinner and didn't know he was there, he noticed that her eyes were always glancing over toward another part of the room where there are several men and a couple ladies gathered at a certain table. She kept looking over. He'd be talking to her and, and he knew she wasn't listening. He'd look over at the table over there. And, he, and then he made little references to it. And finally, when the dinner was, was over, she said to him quite bluntly, uh, would you excuse me for a little bit? I see some friends over there that I need to talk to. Now, he'd been brushed off before, but not quite so abruptly as that. The check hadn't even come yet, <laughs> which it did. And she was gone. He knew she wasn't interested in him at all. That she wanted to over talk with her friend and go on to the next stupid thing she was going to do it uh, during that evening. He got up and he wandered around a little bit and he noticed that the storm was getting heavier and heavier. It's coming down now. You see it out the window. In fact, you could hardly go out as thunder lightning getting pretty heavy. But he wandered over and he, two or three men, uh, one man he knew faintly invited him to sit down. Some men were having a business conference of investing. And he's always interested in making money, so he sat down, talked to him a little bit, and you could see that you could see this is a financial con game of some kind. Put in five hundred dollars, and we'll triple your money in three days, that sort of thing. So he wandered away from there, and the party went on and on while he was just wandering around, not knowing what to do with himself. You know, and I know you've done this, you know. It, you're always hoping that someone is going to take the initiative and approach you and get you started on the path to paradise. 
you know, the lucky break, the beautiful woman coming over, she's dropping her handkerchief in front of you and you pick it up, that sort of, you know, thing. Didn't happen. It doesn't happen. Now the storm was coming down furiously, heavy, not more, more than rain, on it, you know, drenching rain coming down outside. And he looked out and uh, a little thought came into his mind, which we'll return to in a minute. And the party got drunker and drunker. Everybody started to reveal themselves as they really were and went on and on. And he knew now he'd made a big mistake, but here it was later at night. He'd paid for his night at the country club. So what is he going to do? But he knew what the rest of the night was. Go up and go to bed eventually, he thought, and leave drearily in the morning at the start of the circle that started when he first read the ad in the paper. Finally, uh, the storm began to dominate his mind, and he said he'd better take a closer look at it. So he went outside, and he didn't have to be a professional architect or engineer to know that that country club was about to go off the cliff. He could see the, the slides. No one else was out there. They're all inside, drunk. They didn't care what was happening at the hotel because they didn't know. He went on, he knew that it was a matter of, of short time before it would go over the cliff and everyone was going to go down in that canyon, smash. All of a sudden he woke up just to what was his right natural duty, which was to sound the alarm, which he did. He ran up and down, hey, people, the, the hotel's going to collapse. He told him, look for yourself, go outside. The foundation is always crumbling on the, the front edge for four logs, and this whole thing is going to go down there. They were too drunk to listen, huh? Is the world too drunk to listen to what we're doing here? They're paying attention, they went, don't pay attention. He ran up and down some of the rooms, pounding on the doors. The country club's going over the cliff, get out of here fast. Too drunk, too asleep. He went into the knocked on the door and when there's no quick answer he wrote you're not polite when the, the hotel is collapsing he pounded and rushed on in he saw that girl that he tried to pick up he saw her in bed with another man he yelled at both of them they were too drunk ran out again nobody wanted to escape well i'll tell you his complete complete natural natural wisdom intellectual wisdom hadn't deserted him he knew what he had to do which was to get out of there, get out your car and get away there fast. If no one else wanted to come, no one else wanted to pay attention, what concern was that? He had no concern at all. They were told he'd, he'd done what was right, did he not? You mentioned this class, these teachings to some of your friends, your relatives. You mentioned it to them. They're not interested. What's that to, to you? You've done what is right. You're telling them and then you, you dash away and never to return. And that's what he did. And the country club went over the cliff with all those drunk, stupid, foolish people in it. Every single one of them went over. But he was saved. See the general point before we go into specifics of it. He drove away. Now get the, the parallel lesson in it. Listen to what I'm going to say, because it's very difficult to understand. As he went to the last person in that country club and tried to warn them, a sudden awakening came to him. And he was able to look at that person, that last person who he tried to warn, and say, you, sir, are a drunken degenerate. And you, sir, you drunken degenerate, are getting exactly what you asked for. You don't want safety. You don't want to escape. And listen carefully. He said that without an ounce of personal accusation or pleasure. He was saying it as a fact. I want you to look at that drunk world out there 
and be able to say, without ego gratification, without getting pleasure from it, without comparing yourself, you drunken degenerates, you're getting exactly what you asked for. You don't get pleasure out of it. If you do, you are part of that hotel and you will go over too. Do you understand me? You have to be apart from the world. You can't be a part of it. Very calmly, very unemotionally, and very consciously. What do you, what, how would you describe stupid, drunken people who refuse to listen when you tell them that they're about to go over the cliff. Let me tell you something else he understood. He understood what it means to have action without wisdom. Have you ever acted without wisdom? When he was walked into that country club in the first place and his mind little scheming started coming in his mind I'll work the law of averages if I try to pick up ten girls maybe one will work for me see you get one girl out of the ten you've done that of course you don't even know you're doing it you don't even know you do it and when I tell you this will you continue or will you watch your little scheming mind to try to get someone you try the gentlemen you try to pick up any woman to have sex whether they give you company or whatever that means that you are lost that means you're trying to fill your life with the thrill of getting that woman not that sex or romance is wrong I'm talking giving you an opportunity to have right sex and right romance where you're free of it you're so free you don't care whether you pick up that woman or not. You don't care. There's nothing in that yearns. But back to the point. Action without wisdom inside of that country club will always end up in the usual tragedy for you. No matter what you get, what you do, what you think, what you plan, because it's all a part <clears throat> of the country club that's about to go over the cliff. Oh, I tell you, please be truly unique. In which you sit over the edge of that enormous ballroom and you look and see that every other man, gentlemen, every other man in that room is doing what you were doing. Little different techniques is all. The women with their own little schemes, the hard-faced women. All they can talk about is how they fight with their ex-husband. That's all she wants to talk about and how badly he treated her. Get out of there fast. Don't have another word. Don't, don't say a word to her. Get up and politely pay the bill and walk away. Good evening, madam. Walk away. You look and see what you are trying to do inside that country club. What are you trying to get? What are you trying to do? And see that this temporary little physical social life that you have now, it has no endurance to it at all. It must always end in emptiness. And if you see that that world out there has no reward, nothing to give you, please, the word nothing means nothing. Nothing to give you but heartache and treachery and betrayal and sorrow and it's your fault maybe you're one of the other men or women in that motel and some someone who's seeing what's happening comes along and tells you better get out of here fast why don't you try listening sometime instead of being a stupid egotist who thinks you know more than everybody you know more than everybody how come you're so hateful which you are how come you have to be so defensive? It is possible and you must use your experiences inside that country club to see where you are, what you're doing, and see that it can only end in another circular experience for you. You're, so you're right back where you started. The only alternative is for you, to, I'm going to use a strong word, all right? Not, not too strong, but I, I rarely use it. You, you have to get so disgusted with that world, 
so disgusted with what has taken you over. Not you. Don't be disgusted with you. There's no you to be disgusted with. But with what has taken over your life, the forces that make you think the way you do, get angry the way you do, get so disgusted with, leaving, with leading a disgusting life. So th that you look out and you say, the only intelligent thing to do is to get out of here and get out now. Don't you wait one second. The country club's going to go over the cliff. Get out of there before it does. Before you get hardened beyond the point where you can no longer hear the warnings. They were all too hardened, too drunk to hear anything. You're listening to the pure truth right now. You listen to it. You pay attention and you get out of there. To get out of there means for you to get outside of your present nature that only knows timidity, that only knows fear, that only knows, that only knows I've got to get something. If I don't get something, I don't, I don't know what I'll do tomorrow or a week from now. Oh, what a marvelous experience to simply see what's going on inside of there, including seeing what you've been doing all the time. And you stand up and you get out of there and you, you walk swiftly out of that parking lot. And by the way, the minute you get in your car and drive away, oh, what a different world you'll be in. You know you're never going back to another country club. You know it. If you see it, you'll know. How can you go back? you drive away. This is the beginning of a real spiritual experience. Put all this together, our time is up, and take a break. Think back to some time when you had an especially severe crisis. Something that kept you turning and tossing all day and night long. In which you searched frantically around for an answer and found a thousand answers and then had to go on to the next thousand. And then one day, accidentally, not through any intelligence of your own, really, because if you have a thousand answers, you have no intelligence, you just have a split personality. But through accidental factors, the problem vanished. The man went out of your life, the money arrived, the health problem was not as severe as you thought it was, the anxiety went away, and that particular crisis was settled. And you felt relief. Think of the word settled, that's what I want to impress on your mind right now. Something being settled. You know, when something is settled, it's solid. Like my hand on this table. Nothing disturbs it. It's at rest. So that particular problem was settled in your life. And then the next one came. Right? A little different in nature. But equally painful, nerve-wracking. And you didn't know who to talk to. Oh, you talked to people here and there, told them your troubles. By the way, I better tell you something right now so you'll never forget it. When you talk to other people about your troubles, you're a very cruel person. Who gave you the right to burden other people with the difficulties that you as a potential self-developing human being should solve for yourself. See? L look at your low level. You don't even know that it's wrong to burden other people with yourself. With your nature. You don't know that it's wrong. As a matter of fact, you think it is right. You think it is a good thing to do. Of course, you justify and you lie. It's good, it's normal, isn't it, to talk things out? It is abnormal to talk things out. Now, you either want 
out of the whole life mess or you don't. If you want out, then you listen to what I just said. It is abnormal. It is neurotic. It is cowardly. It is weak. It is anti-religious, anti-spiritual to burden anyone with one ounce of your ton of difficulty. That isn't going to change you, is it? That, that, is, that, that truck that's rolling down the hill a hundred miles an hour, what I just said isn't going to stop that truck at all. That mechanical nature that you have that's rolling so fast, creating all these uncomfortable, unsettled situations, that truck isn't going to slow down by what I just said. It could. It could, it could, if you love truth more than you love yourself. Oh, this dreadful, wretched, self-enclosing, hard and icy self-love that you have. Which, by the way, I should inform you, is just a phrase. Because there's no self and there's no love. But we use words. And if you can understand elementary explanations of it, you can go on to more advanced ones. The point being so far is that it's just a, a terrible life to live, the way you're living it, because you never get any rest. You've been physically tired when you've been forced to endure work for a long time. Maybe extra work down in the office or around the house, something had to be done. And you wanted to stop, didn't you? But you couldn't. You want to stop your agitation. You can't. You're compelled. Listen to this. You're, or listen to this. I'm describing you. Now I want you to see how exactly I describe you. <coughs> which means I know a lot more about you than know, you know about yourself and you don't know anything. You don't know anything about yourself except what you want for dinner. You're under a chronic compulsion. And I'll explain it in so much detail you can never be able to deny it again. <coughs> You're under a chronic compulsion to think about other people in relation to yourself, in relationship to yourself. You can't stop it. Who'd you think about today? Who were you irritated with today? Who were you tied to by a mental rope that you couldn't stop thinking about? <clears throat> with a lot of emotion involved in some cases. Thinking about someone who could do you some good thinking about someone who, who seems to be a threat to you and you don't know how to get rid of the threat, thinking of someone, how about this, thinking of someone that you'd like to have into your, into your empty, miserable little life. You'd like to have them in your life, wouldn't you? How strange. That person you now want in your life, what is, would that be about the 20th boyfriend, 30th girlfriend? 50th financial advisor, someone to talk to. Nothing ever changes. And I'll tell you why nothing ever changes. Because you're doing everything possible, you're doing everything possible to keep yourself unsettled, keep yourself agitated. The last thing, the last thing you want is to settle down and have a quiet, peaceful, a quiet, peaceful, and commanding life. A, a life, if you can understand the next phrase, a life with 100% power. See, here's the problem with what I just said. You don't know what power is. What you know is intimidation. What you know is tears. What you know is pressure. What you know is nervousness. What you know is desire. 
I want that. And you think that wanting is power. It is not power. It is neurosis. It's destruction. So hardened as a habit that you can't see it. You never slow down long enough to see it. And so here you are in this room. And if someone was to ask you, what are you doing here? You'd say, well, I'm trying to change my agitated nature to a quiet nature. I'd, I want to settle my life down. You just told a lie. You, you don't want to settle down. What you want is to use every trick possible to maintain yourself as you have always been. And the perfect evidence of that is that you don't really change. Is there one person in this room or listening to me who honestly knows what it means to be acted upon by something outside of himself so that there is one small, at least one small but very definite way in which you think toward yourself and the outer world. Is there one person who, who knows what it means to make an honest, sincere, true, factual statement about inner change? Occupancy in this hall does not change you. Reading books does not change you. One thing does. For you to suspect that you have lied to yourself about your motive in life and see that you have ascribed to yourself a false motive which should be evident enough because you haven't changed. You say, I want to change. If you want to change, you will change. Now change means the falling away of everything that has kept you unsettled. That has kept you, that has kept you looking out at the world with suspicion and with fear and resentment and with all oh, with a great dread, listen to this, with a great dread of what the world can do to you, uh, the people out there, you're afraid of what they can do to you. You're afraid of what the financial changes can do to you. You're afraid of what the pressure of society can do to you. I tell you, you don't know at all what it means to think clearly toward yourself or toward the world out there. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. There is no fear, as far as you're concerned, in another person, that dominating parent, boss. There's no fear. Listen, there is no fear in the news report that the finances of the world are going to collapse. There's no fear in that report. There's no anxiety and tension and dread in the news that something bad is going to happen to the world, that war is going to come. I tell you, there is no fear in that, but you project it out. The only fear that exists for you and you and you is the fear that is in you. You won't see that. You want to say, I'm afraid of what they are going to do with to me and against me. You won't see that the fear you have is the fear you have. There is no fear outside of you. Which shows again, which proves how utterly corrupt and immoral you are. How you, yes you, listening to me, you caused that six o'clock news report that sent a shudder through you. You did it. You. And you have the nerve. You have the cowardice to say, they are doing that to me. Let's, let's see if you'll take this. 
Let, let's see if you, if you have any honesty or decency at all. Here it is. Ah, you'll lie as you always lie. Only you are bad news to you. Oh, you say, well, that's great. That's fine. I, I understand that. I take it. Tomorrow, when you watch the 6 o'clock news, watch your reactions. Watch, watch how you fear talk to, or talk to other people. Watch how you, you fear what they can do to you. They are you. Now, I've told you how to get settled. You see that they are you. A me you shatter division. You put an end to your weeping little self-pitying cowardice. You put an end to that. And you begin, you begin to become a good man, a good woman, an honest man, an honest woman. And now you begin to settle. If you don't have any enemy out there in that news report, or in those people who you think are pressuring you, you're pressuring yourself. If you don't have any enemy out there, what's there to be afraid of? Could it be, and it is, could it be that you just want to have enemies? You want them more? You want to have men enemies more than you want to settle down? Could it be that you are so in love with thinking. Look, stop right there. Could it be that you're so in love with thinking that you won't give it up in exchange for a state of non-thought, which is the same thing as being settled? You know, I got a phone call recently from a lady, and she was troubled concerning a family situation. And as she talked on the phone, she related the details of the problem. And in one place where I made a certain statement to her, she said that made my heart leap with anxiety because I'd said a certain thing which she had known unconsciously was true about losing someone, and I'd brought it up and she reacted to it not knowing that it was her reaction, triggered by the words, but it was her own reaction. And she said to me, you know, the reason I phoned you is because I had a book of yours for many years, and it was sitting off in the corner of the house somewhere. I didn't pay any attention to it. But then this domestic crisis came along, and I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what else to do, so I went and got your book and read it. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, is this going to be the pattern of your life where an extra severe crisis comes along and you say, okay, if I have to, I'll get spiritual. You see, you are forced to turn for help. And you turn toward a book, in this case, one of my books. She turned toward it, and you turn toward it. And you think that the intensity of your pain and agitation is also the intensity of your sincerity, which it is not. And then when the crisis goes away, it settles temporarily to make room for the next one. When the crisis goes away, the book goes away again. Now, that book can be very symbolic. It can mean, it can mean that all the time during your day, you are going to take a certain move, which we can call spiritual initiative. That is a good thing. Spiritual initiative in which you are going to try to find the answers to your life when things are going smooth as opposed to when they're going rough. 
What you say, why should I do that? If things are going well, why do I need spiritual solutions at all? I'm talking to the world as well as to you. I, I, I sit here in absolute astonishment that you can be so ignorant. That you can be so closed, you have your spiritual eyes so closed that you, that you can, can't see that when you say things are going well, that it's only because you haven't seen them. It's only because just for the moment you've been excited about something, you put that problem out of your mind and then the next one will come along and you'll reach for the book again. That is not spirituality at all. That is simply being a little coward who thinks that life itself, listen, a coward and very ignorant, thinks that life itself as it is can satisfy you. Which means again that you have not seen, you have refused to see the depths of your dissatisfaction, and let's make that a little stronger. You have not seen the depths of your distraction. You have not seen the depths of your fury and rage. You mean to sit there and tell me that just because for the moment, because you have a good dinner in front of you, that you're not enraged, that you don't have rage? I'm going to give you a solution. It's very, very profound, and very advanced. And when you, when you reach the end of this solution, that is you take it, and you see that you have to give meaning to it. I'm giving you words. I don't give you meaning. Do you understand that? You have to give yourself meaning. This is individual work. You get the words, you get the illustrations, you get combinations of ideas, which is all good and all necessary. One thing has to come from you. That's the meaning of what we're talking about, the understanding of it, right? Okay, follow, follow this. In your reactions to life, in your responses to life, in your contacts with the world and with other people, I want you to first of all think of what I'm going to say, then we'll go on from there. I want you to think about what it means to have a mental reaction toward the challenges of life, a mental reaction which does not include you. Just now, in your present unhappy, hardened, self-deceitful state, all your thoughts involve you. They involve what you want, how you can make the best impression, what you should do in order to feel safe in this unsafe world. All your thoughts, your mental projections now totally connect with you, which is why you remain unhappy. You, the self, the acquired identity, the self-glorified self, is always unhappy, suspicious, nervous, apprehensive. Now, if that is so, is that not a clue to you as to what you were, what and who you are now living from. You are living from a mind, a collection of thoughts, which unfortunately and tragically includes you. What you think is you, what you have called myself, without thinking, without knowing what you're doing, 
you say I must protect myself from the scary things I see on the news. I must make other people like me, approve of me. For one reason, if other people don't like me, then I will feel bad. And I don't want to feel bad, I want to feel good. And that's another lie. Four. To feel good about yourself is to feel bad. Because you have said that I am the person who got a thrill, who got affirmation from that man who said he loved me, that woman who said she loved me. I got affirmation of being someone who is loved Therefore, isn't that good? No, that is not good at all. That is bad because that's a delusion in the first place that you know what love is. And in the second place that there's someone there to be loved. That, look, there is no one to be loved. There is love. There's no one to be loved. If there's someone to be loved, that is not love, I tell you. If there's someone to be loved, that is hatred. You, you willing to, to dig into the ground, the hard, stony ground, day after day, week after week, year after year, until you reach down and find the, the treasure that we're talking about? I'm asking you, if you're willing to dig for years to understand what you've heard just in this talk, right now, to say nothing of all the others, but back to the original point. Can you not, I'll rephrase that, will you please from now on notice that every time you think you have a self in it, you have a me in it. You have your name. What's your name? You put your name in it. You put your memories of self in it. You put your experiences in it. All of which is madness. All of which <coughs> keeps you the way you are. Oh, how fascinating. Having, <clears throat> having seen the problem, having seen the problem, we now know the solution, don't we? Oh, we've seen how we thrust ourselves into every situation possible, believing in ourselves stupidly, because there's no, no self there at all. Believing in ourselves, trying to believe in ourselves thinking that the self can get rid of pain caused by the self? Impossible. Now, by understanding the mistake, we understand how to stop it. There is understanding of how to stop the mistake when you simply see clearly what you're doing. How many of you here, I'll, I'll be generous with you, how many of you here in the last month how many of you one time in the last 30 days have caught your thinking, watched yourself thinking, and saw how everything has miserable you in it, and said, ah, I got a glimpse of my problem. Me. Self-reference. Look, look. It is possible for you to go all the way with the solution. So there's no such thing as bad news for you. No such bad news. I don't care what happens, whether you think you're growing older or you're losing something. Or you've got all these bad memories of early childhood. I tell you, you could be in a position where there's no such thing as bad news. 
No such thing as the world being a threat to you because you've learned how to think without putting a delusion into that thinking. You see the news that big war is about to start. And you say, huh, oh, I see, a big war is about to start. You know, it's a fact, maybe a big war is about to start. You think, ah, oh, the money is going to come crashing down, finances are going to fall down, everybody's going to lose their money. Oh, I see, that's what's going to do, do you have Do you have any perception at all? Don't you know that a truly spiritual mind is not troubled by that world? That it's not in it, it's not part of it, it sees and it understands. I'm going to repeat something. Let's see if you can get it. You hear that news, or you think about those threatening relatives, something bad that's happening to you. If you put yourself into it, you think there's a self that's going to get hurt. First of all, you will be afraid. But here's the main point I want to make. Something which I, I wonder if one human being in a billion sees this. If you are afraid of anything bad, I'm not talking about physical things. You mustn't go down to the slum part of town where someone's going to hit you on the head. We're not talking about that. If you're afraid psychologically, if you're afraid mentally of something bad happening to you, you cause that not only to happen to yourself, but to everyone else. See, you know, you know what it means? You know what it means to be good? What it means to be good is to no longer do unto yourself what you used to do unto yourself and against yourself. Therefore, there's no way you can do it against others. Hurt yourself, hurt others. No longer hurt yourself, impossible to hurt others. All that purity now, which is not yours, which comes from a high place, all that purity, all that purity is, to put it this way, is thinking for you, is taking all the impressions in from the outer world out there, comes in the impression, and it doesn't fall on you. You vanish. That, that stupid, sick, neurotic, hardened, vicious, yes, that's what you are. You say, I'm not vicious. You are vicious. If you're lost, you're vicious. You know you are. Don't kid me. All that will go through hard work and understanding. Now you're settled. And listen, listen. Nothing, nothing in time, nothing in the past, nothing in the future, nothing in society, nothing inside yourself can ever take away that that settled state, that quiet state, that look, that goes around the world, you go out to work, you go home, whatever you do, you look out at, out at the world. Nothing affects you because there is no, the, the dark, because look, look, nothing affects you because there's no way that darkness can affect and injure the light. And you know that, you, you know why you know it? Because you're participating in this light and you look around, you, you look around, if you do your worst, don't let tell the world to do its worst, and nothing it can do. If everyone on earth was against you, no one would be against you. There's no you to be against. Work on all this. Just take a break. Pitiful person. Now, when you think of the phrase, pitiful person, you can go in various directions with it. And I'm going to give you two of the directions and I want you to go in both of them, one at a time. Are you a pitiful person to another person? How do you suppose other human beings see you? There is something wrong in you that likes, at the same time dislikes, another person to see you as pitiful. One, you get their attention. Two, you may get their 
help. Three, you may get something financial, physical out of it. The playing of the role of being pathetic or being pitiful is one of the most sought after, desired roles in the mad theater of life. Any human being who unconsciously persists with his role playing in small or large ways will never enter the kingdom. You must therefore be a very stern judge with yourself as to how other people see you and then see that you want them to take you as being pitiful. If you can catch you ladies uh, you men, if you can catch yourself in the smallest little short performance of being pitiful, of being ignorant, of being helpless, of being lost, if you can catch yourself in even a small brief performance, like saying, oh I'm so dumb, I don't, I don't get that, if you can catch yourself, you will have given yourself a dose of health. To play the role of being pitiful absolves you, unfortunately, from the self-responsibility of destroying all theatrical performances, large or small, short or fast. You think that you can hide behind a role and not only evade the responsibility but get a reward from the world and you will get a reward. But you will get the reward, the only kind that society has to give you, which finally comes down to two tricksters playing tricks on each other and destroying each other. Where you cooperate with your own despair and destruction, where you cooperate with it, there will be a thousand people out there equally willing to cooperate with it because they get what they want out of destroying you. Now, if you are a pitiful person, that is nothing but a falseness, a false front, a role, a game, a self-deception by which you hope to deceive other people in order to give you what you think is a place in life, solid ground it will never arrive. What will arrive is the mutual self-deception followed by self-destruction of everyone involved in the game of please feel sorry for me because look at how I look. Look at the terrible thing that happened to me in the marriage. Feel sorry for me. Give me things. Talk about me. Give me attention. Tell me, ah, uh, listen how dreadfully important this is. Tell me how innocent I am for having been persecuted by evil people. Don't you know when you call yourself innocent, you call the other people guilty and that's what you want to keep your pitiful self-destructive game going. You will therefore, right now, 
at this very moment that you're hearing me talk. You will know that you are involved in being pathetic, weak, helpless. And you will be shocked and dismayed that you have not seen it before, not seen it clearly, so that you can begin to dissolve it and also dissolve the built-in punishment and grief and contradiction that goes with it. You will know right now, and you can do it right now while I'm talking to you, you will know that you have made a horrible mistake. That mistake is that you act out by your facial expressions, by your words, by any means you can to convey a message to other people in the family, at work, anywhere. You convey a certain destructive message to the world that says, I, I am weak and I suffer a lot and I'm lost therefore please give me help give me something give me anything but above all give me your attention look at me please look at me when you don't look at me, I don't know who I am. If you look at me and feel sorry for me and so-called pray for me, when you do that, I feel that I'm okay. You have asked the world for something which you will get, which is an increasing depth of darkness in you and if you don't stop it now you will continue to slide down deeper and darker to where you won't be able to hear what I'm talking about therefore you will be trapped by yourself and to the horror of it all you will continue to play the role of a person who needs a lot of sympathy for what they've suffered as if you're the only human being who has suffered look at your conceit look at your vanity as if you're the only one who's had troubles and problems you're not but you want to be see false falseness the false identity self inside of you while pretending to do otherwise always demands itself to be exclusive this is where jealousy comes in you demand you demand to be the only person on earth who's worthy of attention because of how much you've pain you've had because you've been neglected and no one ever gave you a chance and so on since you are playing this role, you must see that it is simply a role. It has no reality at all. Where? Where do you find reality in falseness? This is false. It has nothing real about it, nothing practical, nothing beneficial, nothing of a spiritual advantage, goodness for you. This unseen role, largely unseen by you, which is why you can continue it, because you don't see the dangers in it, the threats in it. It, it is bad. Therefore, you're doing something bad for yourself that you don't know is bad because you call it good. Stop calling it good. And instead of calling it good when it's bad, investigate it until you see the evil in it. You have gone down this road to feeding a false nature long enough. You've traveled down that road far enough and now is the time to stop. And you stop by investigation of what you've heard and saying no more. Because you begin to suspect the truth 
of what I've told you, that it's all the show, all the game, and you are the first one to be the applauding audience. I tell you, when a sick human being who seeks sympathy in his sickness, seeks attention, and the tears spill down his cheeks before another person after having told all the troubles that he's had or she's had. When that actor turns away from the person he's talked to, when he turns away, there is a very definite self-applause going on. And do you know what that says? It says something extremely evil. What else can it say but evil? What can the false nature do but say evil? It says, I fooled them. I tricked them again. They fell for it. And then it adds, Aha! What a marvelous, powerful, wise human being I must be to be so clever as to fool other people with my pathetic, pitiful, pitiful act. There is the I, the self, the me. There it is in all its hideous expression. Right in front of you, if you can see it. A great leap, therefore, is necessary if you're going to stop damaging yourself with this false performance. And if you wish, any of you listening to me right now, if you wish, you can indeed stop right now from continuing to build the role, because I told you earlier, if you continue to play this role, you will no longer be able to distinguish between the actor and who you really are. And that is the fate of the world, that they have not come to this place of truth, have not come to this room, which is a sacred place. They have not come here so that the truth in this room could show them the difference between what is real and what is false. Now you were here and you were listening to this talk and you can have this atmosphere wherever you may be listening to this talk. You can have the same atmosphere that's in this room right now if you invite it because truth is without time and without space. Wherever you are, not in this room at the present, wherever you are, you can listen to the words and let the words go to the receptive spirit inside of you. And you can begin to feel the truth that you have invited. And it is the light, the truth itself, that holds up a big sign that says stop. You hold up that sign, you hold it as, as weakly and as trembling as you hold it up before the forces of darkness. You hold up that sign that says stop. You watch the nervousness in the continued evil that comes in and tries to take you over. You notice the nervousness of the character actor who sees that sign, who's been on stage for all the years of your life and is so used to performing once at two in the afternoon and another time at eight, another time at midnight or whatever. It, it is going to object to you putting it off stage. All you have to do, and we'll show you how to do it all together, is hold up the sign and keep it up there because it is the truth that impelled you to do it in the first place. As, as much as you shake, keep your hand up. Go ahead and shake all you want. The sign will shake. You keep it up. And the truth, the light will keep you more and more, more steady. Pretty soon it's, it's, it's a very automatic thing with you. 
and you see the actor coming in, and the pitiful actor trying to get you to play that little role again where other people will feel sorry for you, will come around and pat your shoulder and, and give you things. Pretty, pretty soon it won't want to come around anymore because it is no longer welcome. You, you must do everything possible to make it unwelcome. Have you ever had a, a friend, an acquaintance, or you were with them for a long time and after a while you, you saw that you could no longer afford their company, it was so bad? Yes. Ever had that? You know, they were deceitful. They leaned on you, they drained you. How many of you ever been drained? I see a lot of hands. Ever been drained? And you finally came to the awareness that you didn't want them around anymore, but now you're in conflict. How do I tell them, right? How do I do it tactfully? Now, why do you ask that question at all? I'll tell you why. You ask that question because you're afraid of them blowing up at you. Let them blow up all they want. Let them scream. Let them holler. And, and they will. They're beginning to see and fear that they can't exploit you anymore. That they can't take you. And they're going to do every trick. You could name them, couldn't you? Because you went through the experience a number of times. The threats, the tears, they will play the same pitiful role that you used to play. But now because you understand how you used to trick other people, you clearly see what they're doing. And I tell you, for, for a while, you will fall for it. You believe Please, don't be so dumb. You believe that when a man or a woman says, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, you believe that he means it. He doesn't mean it. That is his little trick to keep you in his life. So that he can hurt you again. Now, he may not just say it by words, because they're, they're smart enough to vary the apology. You know, the gift... The, the friendly phone call or whatever. Now, do you have enough intelligence, please, to notice what he says, I'm sorry, and then he does the same thing again. Now, can you be sorry when you repeat an offense? You're not sorry at all. You just want to keep exploiting the individual to get falsely what you want from him. Now, now let's get back to you and your attitude. When a person tries to work on you, to make you feel sorry for them, you should understand one beautiful spiritual rule that will save you from ever falling for his charlatanism, for his or her trickery. You, of your human personality, of your mental self, owe nothing to any human being on earth. Furthermore, you have nothing to give any other person on earth. Therefore, when you hear the sob story, when they tell you how much they have done for you in the past and now you owe me something in return, I want you to remember something that will save you years of grief which is that God himself, truth itself, says to you, don't give anything to anyone who pleads for it, because if you do, and do it in emotionalism, and in wrong thinking, you will be accomplishing the opposite of what you think you are doing, that is, you will give them something bad instead of something good. Now, that's just the first point. The main point is, you, you must go against your own belief that you have value in yourself and say to the other person, or silently, whichever is the most proper for the occasion, <coughs> you will say to that individual, I really have nothing to give you. Now, when you have this higher inspiration, this higher light coming down, 
there's no question in your mind whatever but that you can live without the whole world not socially you have to go shopping we know that you have to get a mechanic to fix your car we're not talking about those things we're talking about we're not talking about your social self but about your eternal spirit you've got all your answers from the original source source with a capital S right from the original source way up there and so for the first time you live you didn't live before you endured right now you live and again if you were the only person on earth who understood what is going on you would understand it perfectly you don't need anyone to tell you what's going on because truth itself God himself is telling you and with that is perfect contentment and eternity